NanoHub U online instruction. Welcome back. I'm Professor Rickus. This lecture kicks off our section of devices in the course. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about biohybrid devices. We'll talk about what is a biohybrid and what opportunity bio brings to the engineering. And we'll look at some examples to give you sort of a sense of what some different biohybrid devices are, including biohybrid robots, living electrodes, whole cell biosensors, and brain computer interface. So biohybrids live where inorganic meets the organic, right? So the organic world is where our cells live, biomolecules, DNA circuits, all this organic chemistry. At the or inorganic end is where our silicon-based chips and our uh, computer chips and metals and glasses, nanomaterials exist. And the hybrid world is where these two things come together, where the inorganic and biological coexist, particularly with living cells involved. So again, thinking about our sort of at a hierarchy of inorganic, down from inorganic uh, elements that we think of gold and uh, silicon into individual components of a circuit, into integrated circuit chips, and perhaps the computers that pull all these things together into a working device. And on the biological correlation of that, we have sort of the elements that we can think about in organic chemistry, carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, the biomolecules that these atoms make up, such as the DNA, and the cells that then assemble to form higher organisms, such as us, humans. And again, this hybrid world is where these things come together, where cells and chips live together, cells and electrodes, for example, where we can build DNA circuits to function and be analogs and to integrate with um, actual electrical circuits, as well as hybrid devices where computers meet organisms and perhaps even our own brain. So just to distinguish really quickly, there is a field of hybrid materials. The difference when we're talking about biohybrids is that we're really focusing on the living. So the field of hybrid materials, a hybrid material is when we bring two components, typically one inorganic, one organic, and integrate them at the nano and molecular scale. Just for example, this um, example we have here of silica, inorganic silica, coated collagen fibers, right? So we have an inorganic coating on an organic system. But biohybrids, what really distinguishes biohybrids is that the integration of these living biological components um, with non-living functional devices. So what does bio offer to engineering? Well, some speculate that biological engineering is poised to outdo all previous engineering fields. Why make these sorts of speculations? And this is really based on what biology brings us, this ability to miniaturize and in some ways reach even greater um, scales of miniaturization than what we've been able to do in computer chips, for example, and to miniaturize in both three-dimensional space and in time as well as the inherited billions of years of evolutionary, basically, of innovation and testing that have given us an existing set of parts and systems and devices that we can use to engineer and re-engineer. And by combining these two things to really produce perhaps accelerated evolution. And many are looking at sort of the time scale of this and, um, Moore's law is about one and a half fold for a year. And right now, many are estimating the rate of biotechnology growth to be even greater than uh, Moore's law. And so there's a now somewhat famous curve called the Carlson curve, which is sort of the DNA equivalent of Moore's law. So here we have a curve showing Moore's law in blue over time, looking at the number of transistors per chip um, in our computer and integrated circuit devices. So the biological equivalent of that here is produced in Carlson's curve. We have in the red line reading DNA and the uh, yellow line writing DNA. And we're, they, they've plot these now as the synthesis and sequence, basically productivity. How many bases per person per day can be read or written 
um, over time. And you can see that it's been growing quite steeply and even started uh, accelerating a little bit here for reading DNA. And these sorts of tools are what is really one of the main things that's driving a lot of the innovation in the biological engineering world uh, right now. So, and just to give sort of an example of this, to sort of open up your mind a little bit, is the area of DNA data storage. So, this has really gone from something that's um, hypothetical, and theoretically, to give you some sense of data storage in DNA, theoretically, you could store million terabytes or exabytes of data in one gram of DNA. To sort of put that in scale, there's an estimated about 3,000 exabytes of data in the world today. So there have been a couple examples of actual data storage uh, in DNA molecules in 2011, 2012. Here's an example from uh, George Church's group showing this work where they stored um, some data from literary works and such in DNA and then reread it back. And more recently, there was an announcement um, from Microsoft and University of Washington. Here, they're showing about 200 megabytes of data stored in, the, uh, stored in the equivalent of what's in this little tip of DNA right here. So that just sort of gives you a sense of what might be possible and how DNA might scale up with some of our um, tr tr more traditional technologies. Okay, so let's look at some specific examples of biohybrid devices and the kinds of things that people are working on right now. And so this includes biohybrid robots, the brain computer interface and neural implants, whole cell biosensors, and living electrodes and living optrodes. So let's talk about uh, biohybrid robots uh, first. And we're gonna look at a couple examples here. So here's an example that was a uh, published in Science not too long ago. And so here is this biohybrid robot of living cells integrated into this artificial ray. So biohybrid robots typically have an integration of cells and tissues with electronics and mechanical structures. Quite often, but not always, they mimic living organisms as in this ray example here. They're typically mobile and impart new functionality. For example, we could add sensors uh, to this now robotic ray. So let's look at this particular example a little bit deep, more, a little bit deeper so you know what we're talking about. So here's an actual living ray and here we have um, the artificial bio robot. And if this is robots really built by some layers here, okay? And so here they've got some elastomers, this three-dimensional structure that they build, um, a gold uh, skeleton layer, another uh, interstitial elastomer layer, so we've got these polymer layers, and then there's a layer of living cells that form the muscle. And this layer four, what this is, is cardiac myocytes that have been genetically engineered to respond to light. And the left and right fins in the biohybrid robot respond to different wavelengths of light, allowing maneuvering of the robot in different directions. And those cells were coupled by gap junctions, allowing for wave propagation and coordination between the cells, hence forming this artificial muscle layer that allows one to guide and steer the movement of the robot. So another area uh, that is quite active and has been growing over the last decade is the brain-computer interface. And this is really where we have human and device integration. Main areas driving these have been in areas such as neural prostheses. As a cartoon representation of some of the uh, devices, for example, um, the brain gate device, where patients who are quadriplegic or paraplegic can then use the, um, the device measurement, basically, of the nervous system to operate and control external devices, such as limbs or the cursor on a computer screen. So there are also other brain implants, and brain implants are distinguished a bit by an implant um, that actually regulates brain function. Rather than just reading it and pulling it out and using to run external devices, brain implants can also be used to regulate and control brain function. A couple of the areas really driving this are to control pathological uh, neural circuits in Parkinson's disease and uh, seizures in the cases of uh, patients with epilepsy. So 
everybody likes to make their equivalent of Moore's law. Well, here's the neural implant uh, version of Moore's law and brain computer interface. But this really um, articulates one of the big challenges here in this integration of electrodes and neurons in this case. So there are billions of neurons in the brain. And the question is, how many neurons can we measure from simultaneously at one time? And that's what this graph really depicts. So here we have simultaneous recording number of neurons, and you can see the scale goes from zero to 500. And across here, we have time scale of years. Starting the 60s, 70s, you saw this really growth with the boom of neuroengineering into where we are now in sort of the hundreds of neurons that can be recorded from at the same time. But I just told you that the brain has billions of neurons, and one neuron can make thousands or more connections with other neurons. So this resolution that we have for recording an interface is clearly insufficient. And the next generation technology that people are developing, um, including my lab, is really must break this trend. So this is a, a Moore's Law rule that um, we really must break through in order to get to the next generation of neural implants and even understanding and recording from and understanding how our brain works in normal and pathological states. Okay, so let's move on to sensors. We're gonna talk more about sensors in the upcoming lectures, but just to give you sort of a sense at a high level view of how a cell can be used as a sensor. Well, a sensor is, is something that nothing more than takes an input signal and converts it into some measurable output signal. Probably the simplest, simplest and most common articulation of using a cell as a sensor is to engineer a simple genetic um, encoding sensor where the um, transcription and production of some response signal, quite often um, a molecule that's fluorescent or luminescent and produces light, something we can easily measure. And that production is uh, controlled by some signal input that we're interested in measuring. And so by this very simple genetic circuit, we can now get a response signal, light produced from some input signal, say some molecule that we're interested in. So we can also take these cells, either natural cells or cells that we've engineered, and interface them now to make our biohybrid device and to integrate them often with either an electrode carrying current um, that we're either stimulating or measuring or optrodes that are carrying light, again, exciting the cells or measuring and measuring that light that's produced from the cells. So if we integrate these cells that we have engineered that are perhaps sensors or perhaps actuators with an electrode and an op and or an optrode, now we can produce what is called a living electrode or a living optrode where we can now control the cell function as an actuator using the current or the light and conversely measure the signal output either from current produced or light produced from the cells themselves if they're acting as a sensor. So this hopefully gives you some sense of the kinds of devices that we're gonna be talking about in this section of the course. So coming up, we're gonna start moving both into some challenges and some sub areas of biohybrid device. We're gonna next talk about the cell device bio interface and move on and look in a little bit more detail using cells as sensors and using cells as actuators, as well as look at another challenge of longevity. How do we build um, longevity and stability into our devices, either by inherent stability or by bioregeneration or self-healing of those biohybrid devices? Hope to see you next time.